Hi there. So uh, in this fourth, uh, sorry, fifth lecture, we're going to start thinking about error analysis and how errors work. And uh, very often in science, um, uh, we need to uh, know, or it's meaningful to know, what the uncertainty is in a number that we measure. So for instance, say you measure the, the carbon content in a steel, and you measure your analysis software tells you that it's got a concentration of um, something like 1.035 weight percent. Now is the 035 meaningful? Uh, you don't know unless you know the uncertainty and if the uncertainty, um, uh, say the uncertainty in X is uh, 0.6 weight percent, well then the 0.035 is not meaningful. So we would probably say that X is equal to 1.0 plus minus 0.6 weight percent of carbon in our sample. Um, and usually we would say there's no point in uh, measuring an uncertainty to better than uh, one significant figure, and you shouldn't quote the uh, measurement to any greater precision than the uncertainty. So that would be the right way to write it down, not 1.035, um, not um, you know 1.035 plus minus 0.584. That would be silly. So we would just say it's plus 1.0, plus minus 584 rounds to 0.6, as we say. Uh, so um, knowing the uncertainty is very important. And uh, Squires points out that it's not um, you want to know if your measurement is good enough for the purpose you have for it today. That's an important question. And when you report it, the person who uh, reads your paper might want the number, the data for some other purpose. And they will need to know the uncertainty and to know if it's good enough for their purpose as well. So quoting the uncertainty is absolutely vital. And in fact, if you don't quote the uncertainty, many journals will say you shouldn't report it at all if you can't um, talk about the uncertainty in a sensible way. Um, so uh, you need to be able to talk about uncertainty properly. The other thing is, if your experiment is uh, investigating some hypothesis, you want to know if the result is sufficiently accurate or precise to confirm or deny the hypothesis. Um, if it's not precise enough to confirm the hypothesis, then the hypothesis is still in or out of play. You don't know. Your measurement wasn't good enough. Um, so you have to then go and think about how to make a better measurement such that you can confirm the hypothesis or not. Um, and until you can do so, you probably you haven't really done anything very interesting. Um, so it's tempting to suggest that every experiment should be as precise as possible. But obviously, economically, that's not necessarily sensible. It only needs to be precise enough to confirm or deny the hypothesis you have today. Um, so the uh, extent of the precision that you should attempt to uh, achieve will depend on the purpose you have for the data. So you need to think about the purpose when you're first doing the experiment. Um, now, the other thing is if we, th we need to think about how we estimate the uncertainty um, and how we uh, think about a set of data. So say we, we do a, a bunch of repeated measurements um, of X um, and uh, we put them in, uh, in, in order and we find that um, we, we measure the frequency of occurrence of each value. So this is our value X. This is the frequency of occurrence and we have, we put them in some bins and we measure them as being something like this. We have here, very frequently occurring um, and uh, at some value and less and less frequently occurring as we get further and further away. And the central limit theorem says that there should be some central value and there'll be some spread around it. And typically we say that those will, will assume that those are normally distributed. Um, often that's not actually true. Um, so if you think about earnings data, for instance, the amount of money that people earn in a year, um, you know, uh, earnings frequency against earnings in, in pounds or dollars or whatever your favorite currency is, you know, there's a whole bunch of people who are nothing at all. Right? There's a lot of them, um, all the unemployed, the mothers working at home, um, and so on and so forth, uh, the children, the students, etc. Um, then there's <coughs> a whole bunch of people, so that's actually at zero. Um, and then there's a hu uh, uh, probably some people who earn not very much, there's some people who earn something, and then there's a tale of people going out to you know, Bill Gates, who earns millions in a year, and the thing is, where's the average? What's the average earnings? Well, average earnings in the UK is something like uh, some thirty thousand pounds, thirty-five thousand pounds in London. Um, it's something like there, right? Um, because and this average 
is biased by all these people on zero and these people over here. The median earnings, that is, if we put them in a distribution going from zero to one of all people, probability of when we select a random person, how much are your earnings? There's your earnings in pounds. We'd have a lot of people on zero, up and zero pounds. And then we'd go up, we'd have something, and then we'd have some tail. And at 50%, that would be our median, the middle of the distribution, and that might be somewhere else. Different from the average, the numerical average. Um, and the other one is the mode most frequently occurring is probably zero. Um, so for earnings data, these three things, the mean, that is the numerical average, we'll define in a second, the median, the middle of the distribution of earnings, and the mode, the most frequently occurring earnings, uh, may potentially be quite different things. But if we assume that our data are normally distributed, then the mean, median, and mode will all be the same. Um, and that's not necessarily valid. The other thing is that uh, in assuming they're normally distributed, we have ignored the possibility that there are some long tails. Real experimental data often has longer tails. Um, and sometimes something like the uh, failure of a material might be determined by the most vulnerable part of the microstructure out in the long tail of the distribution of grain sizes or defects or whatever it is. And so uh, for some applications, we want to think about the long tail, the extreme value statistics of the distribution. And that gets quite complicated. But for now, first year undergrad, we're going to work with an assumption that our data is, is normal, normally distributed. So say we have a whole bunch of measurements of x, xi, for i equals 1 to n, some number of values that we've measured, n. And when we say that the average value of x, which we'll call x bar, people sometimes call it the x like that, but we'll call it x bar, um, is then uh, the numerical average is defined as being the sum of all the measurements, i equals 1 to n, of all of the x values divided by n. And that's our definition of the numerical average x bar. Um, and that's called the arithmetic mean, the mean you obtain by arithmetic, by adding things together. Um, then uh, the standard deviation of our population, and we're going to call that sigma. People sometimes call it other things as well. Sigma of our distribution of values x. Sigma squared we define as being the sum over i equals 1 to n of all of the deviations of x from the, me from the mean divided by n minus 1. Um, so the um, standard deviation is the square root of that value. Um, and uh, this is the variance, the sums of the, um, oh, sorry, of the squares of the deviation differences from the mean. So if it's one below the mean or one above the mean, the square takes care of that. It's the sums of the squares of the deviations. Um, and each of these are the deviations from the mean. Now, um, if there, this is assuming that the data xi are a sample of the data in the potential global population. So say there's uh, 120 people in your class, and we ask 10 of you what their heights are, and then find the average and the standard deviation. In doing the standard deviation, we would divide by n minus 1, so 9. Whereas if we had all of you, we would divide by all 110 of you or so, or 120, however many they are in your population. Um, and typically we'll be de dealing with samples, so we want to divide by n minus 1. Uh, that's a little detail. If we've got enough data, the difference between 100, uh, the square root of 100 and the square root of 99 is pretty much the same, so it doesn't really matter. But for small numbers, it does matter. Now, if the data are normally, so that's the that's the standard deviation. Standard deviation. Now, if the data are normally distributed, so that's our frequency of occurrence, and these are our values x, um, then 68% um, of the data, here's my mean x bar, that's sigma, then 68% of the data lie within plus minus 1 sigma. Um, and correspondingly, 32% of the data lie um, outside of that. 
So roughly speaking, a third of your measurement points should be more than one stand deviation away. And if you want a quick estimate of the stand deviation, you can do that quite easily by taking, putting the data in order and taking the central two-thirds, uh, finding the mean, taking the central two-thirds and using that to find the stand deviation. Um, so if you have six measurements, you take the central four, take that range, and that's a quick estimate of the stand deviation. It's not an accurate estimate, but if you've only got six measurement points, you know, what's accuracy? Um, now, the other thing to uh, consider, if you want... Um, plus minus two sigma, you'll be getting up to 95% of the data will be contained within plus minus two sigma, and 99.7% of the data within plus minus three sigma. So only three measurements out of a thousand should be beyond three sigma. And if you look at real experimental data, you'll find typically they have fatter tails than a normal distribution. That is more than three out of a thousand and more plus minus three sigma away. Um, now a further point would be the um, stand deviation of the mean is different to the stand deviation of the population of the sample. So the um, uncertainty or the stand deviation of the mean is given by uh, the sum of x minus x bar squared divided by n n minus 1. And there's a proof of that in Squires, uh, but you can see if you take a series of populations, take their averages, then you would get another n in there, and that's how the n minus 1 sort of arises. But so the uncertainty in the mean is a different thing to the standard deviation of the sample. So this is the uncertainty um, or standard deviation of the mean of x. Um, and... Uh, that's another thing as well. So I need to put a squared in there, or I can put the square root there. That's the third thing. So that's our, our definitions of our mean and standard deviation. And you'll see that in, in working in this area, we're going to have to think about doing working with summations, especially sums of x, sum of x minus x bar, sum of x minus x bar squared, and so on. Now, a further thing to think about is how errors propagate. So uh, say you want to estimate the uncertainty in a, a measured quantity, like a, a yield stress. Um, so I have a, a sample. This can be my sample. It's got an area. I apply a force on it. Um, if I want to know the stress, I need to know the uncertainty in the force and the uncertainty in the area. And I need to figure out how um, if uh, stress sigma, we now have two sigmas rolling around in this, is equal to force over area. If I want to know the uncertainty in sigma, um, then I need to know that's going to be some function, which we need to define, the uncertainty in f, and the uncertainty in a, and potentially in f and a as well. And I need to figure out how to, how to do that, how that to work out the uncertainty in my stress, given the known uncertainty I can probably estimate in my force of my area. And say you measure a yield stress, um, well, you can uh, estimate the uncertainty in that. If you did uh, a number of repeated tests, often we can't afford the metal to do that, but if you did a number of repeated tests, you would get another estimate of the uncertainty in the yield stress. And that would probably be larger than the uncertainty you estimated from a formula like this, um, because you'll have sample-to-sample -sample variability as well as the uncertainty in each of your individual estimates of F and A. Um, but uh, the, this will at least give you a lower bound on what the uncertainty in yield stress, the variation in yield stress is between samples. Um, so um, uh, for the purpose of evaluating whether or not, for instance, your different alloys have different yield stresses, this uncertainty is going to be a good lower bound for being able to decide if your two measurements are really different in terms of the strength of the material or whatever it is you're trying to measure. Um, so in order to do this, we need to start thinking about how functions are going to work. So let's take the simplest function we can think of. Um, let's take a, a function w equals, I'm going to switch pens, take a function w equals x plus y. Now, before we get into that, we're going to need to define an additional thing called the covariance. And um, the covariance, so we've got x, y, we've got the uncertainty in x, the uncertainty in y. We also need to think about a thing called the covariance. 
the covariance at x, y, his call is 1 over n minus 1. Um, and I think, yeah, that's right. Um, and that's times the sum over i of the x i minus x bar times the y i minus y bar. So it's the multiplying the deviation of each point from its mean in x times its deviation from the mean in y. And that gives me uh, a number of x times y. Um, uh, so it's got whatever the, the dimension of x times y is. And that's called the covariance of x and y. Um, so we'll have a further thing, sigma x, y. And that tells us about how much, the extent to which they vary together or vary independently of each other. So we'll define that, having defined that. Now, let's think about the mean of our function w. So we've got our function w, x plus y. So the mean of w is uh, going to be given in the following way. Mean of w is going to be 1 over n times the sum of w's over i. Um, and we can expand out w, 1 over n times the sum of x plus y, xi plus yi. And we can then say, well, OK, the sum of x plus y is equal to the sum of x's plus the sums of y's. So that's equal to 1 over n times the sum of xi plus the sum of the yi's. Um, and that's then, because we're dividing by our n measurements, that's just going to be equal to x bar plus y bar. So the, for addition, the mean of w is equal to the mean of x plus the mean of y. Great. OK. Sort of should be obvious, hopefully. Um, but it's less obvious um, to you if we want to use the population, if we want to find the variance. Um, so um, if we think about variances, then um, I'm going to do it for n but if it was a, a sample, we'd need to use n minus 1. But I'm just going to use n because it's a bit simpler. Um, so if we take the uncertainty in w squared, that's going to be, given by the formula I gave a moment ago, 1 over n of the wi's minus w bars, all squared. OK. Um, now I have to figure out how to multiply that out. I have 1 over n times the sum of my xi plus yi, that's wi, minus x bar plus y bar, that's w bar, all squared. OK, so now I've got to figure out how to expand that out. So I've now got the sum over all i of... Um, so when I multiply this out, I'm going to get an xi uh, squared. Um, and then I'm going to get an xi times an x bar. I'm gonna, I can do that two ways. So I'm going to minus sign when I do it. So minus 2xi x bar. And I'm going to get an x bar squared. And in total, I'm going to get eight of these. So I've got four of them already. I've got to do it for the y's. Um, plus yi squared uh, minus two um, yi y bar plus y bar squared. So now I've got eight. But I've got also to think about the cross terms. So I've got my y times y bar, my y times my yi two ways, my y bar squared, but now I've got to do my x, y, my uh, x, i, y, i, my x, i, x bar, y bar, etc. So I'm going to get a further, when I multiply this out, 2 x, i, y, i minus x, i, y bar, x, i, y bar, um, and I'm going to get a minus x bar, y, i, Got all the combinations, yeah, and uh, plus x bar y bar because the minus signs will come out twice, right? So, and then I've got to close the square bracket now. That, uh, right, need to put squared there. 
Now, that's x minus x bar squared. So this is equal to 1 over n times the sum over i. That's x minus x bar squared, which is sigma x, uh, sorry, x minus x bar squared. That's y minus y bar squared. And this thing is the covariance we defined a moment ago. Um, this thing here. So what I've got here is uh, I've got sigma x squared, um, and there's an n, so I'm just going to put that bracket there, that guy. So that's my sigma x squared. I've got a sigma y squared plus twice the covariance of x and y. Now, if the covariance is small, that is, x and y are independent variables, they don't vary together, then this will be 0, and I can say that sigma w squared is approximately sigma x squared plus sigma y squared. That is, when adding variables together, that's what w is, we can add together the variances of the two terms in quadrature. Um, sums of squares. Similarly, if I had a function w was equal to k times x, I can go through the same sort of procedure and persuade myself that uh, sigma w would then be equal to k times sigma x. So I'll just come through. If we go through, carry on in a similar vein for um, uh, x times y, we can, it's a bit more complicated, but we can come up with a, a general equation for how errors propagate. Now that is, if I have some function f of some variables xi for i equals 1 to n, then the uncertainty in f squared is equal to the sum over i of df dx, so the differential of the function with respect to exi, times sigma xi squared. So um, if I differentiate the function with respect to the first variable, square it and multiply it by the uncertainty squared, then I add it, with this, do the same with the second variable, the third variable, and add them all up, that will give me uncertainty in f. So that's our general formula for the propagation of errors. I'm going to write it over here, sigma f squared is equal to the sum over i um, of df dxi squared sigma xi squared. And notice we're into double subscripts. Ooh, scary. Um, now, let's think about how it's going to work for some simple functions. So let's have a function f is equal to x plus y. So df dx is equal to 1 and df dy is equal to 1. So the uncertainty in f um, squared is going to be equal to 1 squared times sigma xi, sigma x squared, and 1 times sigma y. OK. Let's take a, another function. Let's take f is equal to x minus y. Then df dx is equal to 1, and df dy is equal to minus 1, and sigma f squared is going to be equal to 1 squared sigma x squared plus minus 1 squared sigma y squared. The minus 1 squared is, of course, equal to 1, so we can eliminate those two, and we get the same result as we had before. So for both of those, we get the same outcome. I'm going to switch to another pen. So uh, uh, if we take f is equal to x times y, now df dx is equal to y and df dy is equal to x. So sigma f squared is equal to y squared sigma x squared plus x squared sigma y squared. Okay. Now, if I divide through by f, sigma f 
squared divided by f squared. I'm dividing by x squared y squared. So that's equal to sigma x over x squared plus sigma y over y squared. So when we multiply things together, then the fractional uncertainties add. So sigma x over x is the fractional uncertainty. Say I've got a measurement of 1 weight percent and my uncertainty is 0.1. My uncertainties are 0.1 over 1, 0.1. Um, so a tenth. So the fractional uncertainties would add for a multiplying together, whereas the absolute uncertainties add for addition and subtraction. And if we carry on, we can do f equals x over y. Now df by dx is equal to 1 over y, and df by dy is equal to, well, the x stays the same, and when I get a minus 1 over y squared when I differentiate it. So now I can say sigma f squared is equal to uh, 1 over y all squared sigma x squared plus uh, minus x over y squared squared sigma y squared. If I divide that by f, sigma f um, squared uh, divided by f, I'm dividing by x over y squared, so x over y. I'm dividing by that squared, so I'm dividing by, so if I flip it up, I get y over x, that's that to the minus 1 squared, and I multiply through by that. So now I get sigma x squared, the y squareds cancel over x squared, plus sigma y squared over y squared. Look, because the y squared there, I've got a y to the 4, I still have an x squared, the minus sign goes, the x goes. So now I can just do, take my squares out, and I've got the same answer as I had for multiplication. So multiplication um, and division is the same. What I end up with in both cases um, is an answer for uh, the uncertainty that the fractional uncertainties add. Think about another couple of functions. If I have f is equal to the natural log of x, oh, well, the f dx now is equal to 1 over x. There's no other, uh, no y, so we can just go straight off. So the uncertainty in f squared is equal to sigma x squared over x squared. Right? So the again, the fractional uncertainties add, and we can actually go through and we can say sigma f is equal to sigma x over x. Finally, last one is the, the reverse of the log, which is the exponential, natural exponential of x, e to the x, that's f. df by dx is equal to the same thing, e to the x. Right? Differentiate it, I'll just get it itself. So then sigma f squared is equal to e to the x squared, uh, sigma x squared. Um, and that's then sigma f over f squared just pull that down, is equal to the uncertainty in x squared. So that's my answer there. Uh, so I can rub that out, rub that out, rub that out, rub that out. So now we've got all of the sort of things that we can do, and we can do that for any function we like, with any number of variables that we like. And you'll notice uh, some interesting things. So for instance, if uh, in our measurement, we measure the change between uh, a starting value and an ending value. That uh, is uh, the subtraction, the difference between them. We find the uncertainties add. So if the change is very small, the uncertainty might still be quite big, and therefore we would struggle to measure a small change. Um, so if you're looking for changes in measurements for small effects, um, then quite often your uncertainty can swamp the measurement. And that's a real problem um, in uh, doing experimental science. Um, the other practical implication here is that if the uncertainty in y is small compared to the uncertainty in x, you'll quite often be able to disregard it um, because the uncertainty is dominated by one of the terms. Now the other thing that it's worth thinking about is how errors arise. Um, so for instance, here's a, a, a big ruler, big uh, wooden ruler, and its scale starts, if I move it closer, starts at zero at the end of the ruler. 
Now, many rulers don't do that. Um, my, my plastic ruler here starts a little bit in from the end. And that means that if this wears away, I still have a good measurement at the end. Um, and, uh, but it does mean that I potentially have an offset here. If I say, well, um, how far into the board, if I put, slam this edge up here, butt it up, then my sigma starts there at about 5.8 centimetres into apparently along this ruler but of course there's this edge offset here about five millimeters on this one so I probably want to use this ruler instead and that says it's six and a half so ooh, um, so um, whether or not you have a an end offset here that's a systematic source of potential error and that you can do as many measurements as you like and the systematic error will be in every one um, so uh, the population variance doesn't help you out with that systematic offset, and that's a real problem. So you need to try and avoid systematic errors of influencing your measurement. And quite often, if you're measuring a change, for instance, you don't have to worry um, about that, about that sort of systematic error. Um, but if you really want to uh, a nice ruler, then probably I would prefer to have one uh, like this metal one here, that starts at zero at the end of the ruler so that you can butt up against the end and measure a distance like that very nicely. The other thing is, how does the measurement arise? If I'm looking at uh, this ruler, the most accurate I can probably measure by eye is something like a quarter of a millimetre. The divisions on this ruler are about half a millimetre, and I might be able to, if I'm really lucky, measure something on the division or halfway in between. And if I want to measure the length of something that's only five millimetres long, well, that's a difficulty. So what I w would want, that would make a rather inaccurate measurement, 0.25 in five, you know, it's a 5% error. It's quite big. Um, but if I could do it more accurately, I want to magnify it and then use a finer ruler um, so that I can avoid the problem. Another way, if you're measuring an angle, say, if you want to measure an angle on a circle, so uh, on an arc of a circle, there's an arc. If I want to measure that angle, if I'm, I could take a tape measure and roll it round that circle and then measure the distance. But if I had a bigger arc of circle, I, and I could put my tape measure on, my division's there, I could measure this angle more accurately than if I had a smaller tape, uh, arc of circle. So one way to make distance measurements uh, more effective is to find some way to magnify the problem such that my 0.25 millimetres I can measure by eye is a relatively small uh, component of the total distance I'm measuring. Um, lots of other ways to do things, but uh, uh, you want to think about how you can arrange matters experimentally so as to minimise your uncertainty in your measurement. Um, and I'll assume for that that my eye is a random measurement so I could do it repeatedly or ask several people to do it and we'd all get similar numbers and then we could take an average and that would probably be more accurate um, than a single measurement alone. Um, so the way in which errors propagate and the way in which they arise then influences how we should do our experiments and how confident we are in the data that we get. And the confidence is a very important part of the story. In the next video, what we'll look at is an example of how to do that and then we'll think about some guidelines for doing experiments.